Well, I want us to move over to 1 Samuel chapter 14, and we'll read the first 14 verses, and this is what it says in the Word of God. Verse 1, one day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father, that's King Saul. Saul was standing on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Mignon. With him were 600 men, among whom was Ahia, who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Ahitub, son of Phinehas. This is always like, you know, the word play for the pastors to say all these words, right? And the son of Eli, the Lord's priest at Shiloh. And no one was aware that Jonathan had left. Verse 4, on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was named Bozes and the other Sanah. One cliff stood to the north toward Michmash, the other to the south towards Gibeah. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, verse 6, Come, let us go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. I love this, this reply of his armor bearer, verse 7. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead, I am with you, heart and soul. Jonathan said, Come then, let us cross over towards them and let us see them. If they say to us, Wait there till we come down to you. We will stay where you are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up, because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. Verse 11, so both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes that they're hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we're going to teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. In verse 13, Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in the area of about a half acre. Talk about being unnumbered, right? What we're looking at this morning in these 14 small verses is climbing life's challenges. And I would submit to you that some days are different than other days. Do you believe that's true? Some days are different than other days. They're not a typical day. They're not a normal day. They kind of stand out on the horizons of our lives in their prominence, their distinction, whether good or bad. They're u unusual days. So let me just give you a couple of these things in, in history that would be a unique day. Being Memorial Weekend, if I say 9-11, that's a very unique day for our nation. That's the day that Islamic extremist terrorists flew planes into our, the Twin Towers in New York City, into uh, the Pentagon, and, and tried to do so into the White House. And, and our nation came under siege by radical Islamists that wanted to overthrow what we do, our economic, our power, our military centers. It's an unusual day. To a previous generation, if I say Pearl Harbor, that's a unique day, is it not? If you've ever been to Pearl Harbor in Oahu, in Hawaii, and you are on the memorial, and you don't have to look very far, you just look over the edge or down through the glass in the memorial, and you look at the huge battleship below, and then you see all the other battleships, the USS Oklahoma, the Arizona, and, and all these different ones, and you just see this row of carnage. It was not a typical day for our church or for our nation, right? It was a tough day. It was a very, very tough day. And then what about Armstrong's walking on the moon? If I said that to you, that's a unique day, right? Not a bad thing like the other two, but a very good thing where man took his first steps on the moon, something that had never been done before. One small step for him, but one giant step for mankind, he said. These are not typical days. These are huge historical events, right? And as we look down into our own lives, not every day is the same, right? If you look at your own lives, certain days stick out. Hopefully the day that you did your wedding and you're married. Good or bad, that could be a good day, right? Depends on what marriage you're on. Hopefully the day that your children were born, right? That should be a highlight day, but depends on how they're acting right now. Depends on whether you say that was a highlight day, right? But it's a blessing. But not every day is the same. I remember for Kim and I, when, when we went to a regular well-child visit, and we were told that something was wrong with Sarah, 
And I've mentioned this before in here when she was in the womb. And that was a tough day when we had to go see other specialists. And they said a lot of bad things that she wouldn't be around and she wouldn't survive and these things that we should abort her. And that was a horrible day. But it was a day that God ended up shining through because you see her among us every single Sunday making coffee and being the wonderful child that she is, right? Jonathan had a unique day, right? In this day here, he had a choice to make. Will I climb higher for the Lord or will I hide in a cave like my father Saul? The scripture says this, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Psalms 118, 24, right? And so it's important for us that every single day as followers of Christ, we need to learn from the scriptures that every single day matters. And the reason it matters is because God's in it and because you're in it. And as long as you draw breath and as long as the Lord's on the throne, he can do miraculous, wonderful things. Every single day matters as a gift from the Lord. It's a time that you can make a difference for the Lord, right? Moses encourages us in his prayer in the Psalms, Psalms 90, 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So a particular day may not be historic. It may not be perfect. It may be good or bad, but it is still a gift from the Lord that we need to use wisely so that we can make a difference in this world to build Christ's kingdom. Amen? That's what each and every day should be in our lives, right? Moses continues in that psalm in verse 17 to say, the prayer, establish the work of our hands. And he repeats this, Lord, establish the work of our hands. We must measure each and every single day and seize the day. That old Roman Latin thing, uh, carpe diem, right? Seize the day and make it count. Now, this being Memorial Weekend, um, one particular individual in the military, in the war on terror, sticks out the most to me. Now, I read a lot of those books, and you guys know that. I've often talked about different stories of different battles and those kinds of things. But, but in this Memorial Weekend, one particular person sticks out. When we were bombed on 9-11 by those planes, and that's what I'm calling it, is being bombed. They were used as, as flying missiles. When that happened, we were not prepared for it as a nation. It was very obvious. We were not sure what the response was. Now, we live near four major military bases, NORAD and, and many other things, and so it was a flurry of activity. But somewhere out in Kentucky, there was a group in the Army, the 5th Special Forces Group, planning to go into Afghanistan before it was ever public in the news, before anybody knew. And they were calling upon who's the right person to lead this group. Because the group that we're going to put in is a 12-man ODA team from the 5th Special Forces group. And whoever we put in, there's about a 90% chance they don't come home. So who do we choose to be the tip of the spear in the war on terror? And they chose Captain Mitch Nelson and his 12-man team, his 11-man team after him. They were actually inserted into Afghanistan by a, a series of things that had never happened before. To get where they were going was a nine-hour flight on a Chinook, which isn't supposed to be flying that long. It's not supposed to be flying over 10,000 mountains. They're not designed for that. They flew so high that the soldiers who didn't have oxygen became hypoxic, and they passed out from lack of oxygen. They were in that state for many, many hours. When they woke up, they reported having screaming headaches for days on end and vomiting uncontrollably from lack of oxygen. They had to consent to do that, and they said yes. When they landed, they still had to perform. And what their mission was, was to hook up with a particular lord, warlord in Afghanistan. His name was Dostrom. And he, along with us, were supposed to use military air power of the United States his small two to three hundred man army on horseback to begin the war on the Taliban. But not only that, we were asking this 12 man group to take the two other warlords that were his biggest enemies and to mesh them all together into a military unit to oppose the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. We could not have asked for anything more impossible. See, Mitch Nelson, as he writes in his book, Horse Soldiers, he sees the day. At first they said, we're going to choose somebody else, and he insisted that was going to be him and his team. And then he insisted against all odds, against all the statisticians, against the generals over him, that I will not lose a man, not one, on this mission. And they said, it'll take you three or four months. And he said, the winter is coming. 
in three weeks, and the Russians wrote about this. If we don't get this done in three weeks' time, the snow's going to fly, and then we're toast. There'll be no way to move through the mountains of Afghanistan. They said it's not possible. Hannibal had failed. The Nazis had failed. The Brits had failed. The Soviets had failed in those mountains. There's no way to do it. Well, the end of the story is that, in fact, they did the very objectives of the mission. They did pull together these three warlords and their ragtag groups of armies on horseback. Can you imagine horseback against modern artillery and tanks that the Taliban had left over from the Soviets? And using American military air power strategically and surgically along with those things, this 12-man group and this ragtag army actually pressed in deep into Afghanistan and took a major point that had not been taken in 300 years. You see, history favors the prepared and the courageous that believe in what they're supposed to be doing. And as believers, is that not us, right? One decision by Mitch Nelson changed the tide of the war on terror from us taking it in the teeth to us delivering it to our enemies. One decision by one man, Mitch Nelson, who numbered his days and made them count. And Jonathan, the son of King Saul, is the exact same way, right? He's watching his father in the cave, and he's saying, what are we doing? God's already told us that we're supposed to beat the Philistines, and we've won some, some battles against the Amorites and against some of the Philistines. Something's got to happen. God wants to do something. And with eyes of faith, with eyes of faith, Jonathan and his armor bearer decide that the day is precious and they cannot waste it. One historic day changed the tide of battle for the Israelites because of one vertically inclined person. It's very important. Now, now think about it, the background. 1 Samuel 13 tells us the background that after Israel's army had beaten up on some Amorites, right? And Jonathan had defeated a small group of Philistines in a small skirmish, Saul foolishly decided to go into all-out war against the Philistines. He did not wait for Samuel. We looked at that last week. He did not wait for Samuel to offer a sacrifice. He did it himself. And by disobeying the Lord, they got pounded, right? And he, he had the, the nation stripped from his hands. It's going to go to King David. That's the backdrop. And so Saul's sitting back, and 1 Samuel 13, 7 says that him and his troops, as numerous as the sand were the Philistines, it was against them. And so it says in 1 Samuel 13, 7 that they quaked with fear, right? And he also had the words of Samuel ringing in his ears of Saul. You have not kept the command of the Lord. Your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought a man after his own heart, and that it would be ripped away and given to another. That's the backdrop for our story. But Jonathan, amidst all that depression and despair, and watching his father, the great warrior, hide in the cave with his 600 men, and having lost this and that and the other, Jonathan believes with eyes of faith. He seeks the Lord. And so there's a few principles I want you to get out of this. The first one is, if we're going to vertically climb higher, we have to seek God, right? When you seek to climb the challenges of this hard life, you have to seek the face of God, right? You have to seek the face of God. Look at verse 1. One day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. You see, Jonathan is seeing with eyes of faith. He believes in his God, and he is seeking where God's involved, where God's working. And he is doing this, and he is saying, let us go over. Yeah, Dad's hiding, and I don't want to let Dad know what I'm doing, but he says to his armor bearer, let's slip over to the outpost, and let's see what God's doing. He's making movements that are seeking God, and he's taking along a companion, right? He wants to see where God is at work. He wants to see where God's going to save Israel from the evil Philistines. Verse 2, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah, right, under this, this pomegranate tree with his 600 men. But Jonathan goes on ahead in verse 4. On each side of the pass was this great big cliff. You would have thought that those were barriers for him, but it is not. In verse 6, Jonathan says, Come, let us go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised men. And this is the key. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or from few. Seeking God is the first principle if we want to climb higher in this life. Jonathan had eyes and a heart that believed in his God. Jonathan had a heart 
that said, God is at work. And you know what? God's going to save. He says of his own words to his armor bearer, God's going to save us. Whether many, his father and his men, or by few, him and his armor bearer. He believes that God's going to move on their behalf. Jonathan is a man of faith. And so he looks out and he sees, he seeks where God is at work in the situation, which seems hopeless, but he knows that God's bigger than the situation, and so he seeks God to change it. Isn't that the principle that you and I should be a part of too? That when we walk into our lives and we see things that look hopeless, should we not seek to see where the Lord's going to be big for us? Is the Lord going to abandon us in despair and hopelessness? Is he going to leave us in the mire? Does God promise that for his people? You and I both know the answer is no. Jonathan looked with eyes of faith where God was bigger in his situation. We need to do the same. So the question I want to offer up to you is, when do we start making changes in our life? Usually my experience is we start making changes in our life when we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right? We get a little tired of the same old, same old. We're happy to sit in it for a long time, to be honest, as believers. God's ready to move. He's got things on the move, but we're the problem. We're the ones sitting back. And when we're finally sick and tired of being sick and tired, then we're ready to seek to see what God's doing. When we finally believe God over believing the lies of this world or of our sin nature that tells us to live a certain way or foolish other people that tell us to do this, this week, a man described to me this very discussion. As believers, he said it's often like we're, we're goldfish in a goldfish bowl, right? You ever watch a goldfish? They'll slam into the glass over and over. We are so much like that, often, that we don't see what God's going to do. Why can't we be more like Jonathan, who looks for where God might be working in me, and what does he do? He goes for it. He just, to use a Nike slogan, he just does it, right? He jumps in feet first. He knew his dad's in the caves with all the men hiding, but hiding is not where God is moving. We need to get over our fears and our anxieties and trust God and seek his face in his hand and see where he's at work. We need to seek to see what God is doing in our lives. And is anybody's life too small for God to be working in it? No. Never. God is in the details. Jesus says he numbers the hairs on our head, right? And he knows when a, a small bird falls to the ground. God knows all the details of our lives, and he cares about them, and he wants to show himself big. So we've we got to take a chance. Now, we've got to use sanctified reasoning. We've got to be intelligent, but we've got to get moving for him. And I often tell people in counseling that, that when you're looking at discipleship, God uses shot arrows. Do you understand? How often does a hunter hit an elk or a deer with the arrow that's sitting in his quiver? Never. Now, you may take a horrible shot. You may take a bad shot. But once you launch that arrow and you let it go, even a blind dog finds a bone now and then, right? You just might hit it. And God can move it to where it needs to be. But we have to be busy seeking where God's working, right? You see a problem in the church or in ministry or in your neighborhood or at work or in your family. Look to see where God wants to show up big. Pray hard for it. Bathe it in prayer. Get involved and see what God will do. When we're seeking God, He can use us. Look for His providential hand behind the scenes with eyes of faith, not eyes of flesh. Did you hear that? Eyes of faith seek God, not eyes of flesh, which never see God. So the very first principle I want you guys to be thinking about from his life is this one. You've got to be seeking God. Look what God says about those who seek him. 2 Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth looking to strengthen, to support, to steady those whose hearts are completely his. If you're a moving arrow seeking God, he's in your camp because your heart is there to glorify him and to be used by him. We have to seek God like Samuel was not doing at first. I mean, uh, Jonathan was not doing it at first, but he eventually did. 
right? Which Saul never did. What holds us back from seeking God at work in your life and fully trusting Him and stepping out on faith and obedience? What is it that keeps you from seizing the day? Later on in 1 Samuel 18, when we look at the life of David, David is just like Jonathan, is he not? When he's approached by this Macedon Goliath, this mighty warrior that's two or three times his size, this beast of a man of rippling muscle with this power and all this strength and all this armor, what does David look at Goliath with? Does he look at him with eyes of flesh or does he look at him with eyes of faith? He sees what God wants to do to take him down and he moves forward seeking God in the situation and he takes Goliath down, right? We just read earlier, Steve did, from Psalms 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So this is the first principle. When you seek to climb over the challenges of this hard life, first, seek God. The second thing I want you to see is in this climb in life, over the challenges of it, choose your companion's life wisely, right? Choose your companion's wife wisely. I'll get it out eventually. Verse 7. Look at verse 7 with me. This is the heart of the armor bearer. I love that. He says, do all that you have in your mind, right? I am with you, heart and soul. Who doesn't want a companion in this life like that? I'm with you, heart and soul. Now, the armor bearer is not a very sexy position. Do we know his name? Does the word of God record who this wonderful young man is? No. Does he get some prominence, his name and lights, by being obedient to God? No. But he sees the man of God, Jonathan, going for it. And he says, I will steal you, right? I'm with you heart and soul. Now, that's pretty easy to do when nothing's on the line, right? One of your buddies says to you, hey, I, I need a hand, Greg. I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. And I say, great. God's with you, right? And he says, no, 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 you're with me. You're going to join me in this. Well, now i got some skin in the game, right? It's a little bit harder. And in this case, they literally have skin in the game. They're going against a superior force at higher ground with superior weapons. And guess what? If they lose, they're going to lose their skin. That's a big deal. Well, what does the armor bearer say? I'm with you heart and soul, right? You know how this works. I can just see it. Jonathan, much like many young men today, says to his buddy, I think I can do that. I think I can take that outpost. I think we can climb that. What do you think, man? Sure. Good, because you're coming with me. Right? How often do we do those things as men? And you can see these two doing this here. But when we're going to seek to overcome the challenges of this life and climb higher, we need to choose our companions wisely. Folks, earlier before the service, I was saying to Lance in regards to an upcoming wedding of their daughter and a young man, Eaton, I say to my son all the time, next to your relationship in Christ, the most important decision you're going to make as a man is who you're going to marry, the woman in your life. She better be godly, she better be good, and she better love you because you're going to mess it up a lot, right? The most important decision you can make as a man. After Jesus Christ is the woman that you're going to marry. The key to being happy as a man after Jesus Christ is to marry up and don't mess it up. I've said that before. You've got to hold in. And in my case, my soulmate, my wife Kim, has been that person, right? I've always been able to rely on Kim. And no matter what we were going through, I've always believed that even when we were at odds, when we were in conflict, when we were fighting it out, that she had my best interest in mind more than her own. Before we were married, she was like that. So it was easy to marry her. And so for 30 years, a little over that, it's been that way that she's been this great friend that has been this soulmate, right? But it's not just her. Talk about my brother Don. You've had him here in the church many times. I know that no matter what's going on in my life, if it's serious, if there's skin on the line that I can call my brother and he'll drop what he's doing and he would be there for me. And if I'm in the wrong, he'll be the first one going toe-to-toe -to -toe with me, challenging and my attitudes. My best friend Scott Cox has been the same way. 
When I broke my back, Scott Cox was there with my brother, right? When his son went down in the James Peak wilderness and had a serious injury way up on the, the Continental Divide, I was there for him, and we expelled them all out over seven hours to the local hospital. When his son took his life three years ago, as an act of honor, he called me first. The sheriff talked to him at 7. He called me at 7.30. And I was there for him to bury his son. That's the kind of relationship that you're seeking. That's the kind of relationship that we're going to see later on in the book of 1 Samuel between Jonathan and David. It says that they were of one heart, that they loved each other more than anything else. Those friends are rare, and they are few. And when you have those kind of relationships, you better invest everything into them and hold on to them because they're not replaceable, folks. Psychology tells us if we have six best friends in our life, that's a good life. If you have three or four friends like that, that's a special blessed life. When you have those people in your life, you better invest in them. You better love them. You better forgive the things they do wrong. And you better hope that they forgive the things that you do wrong. But we all need a companion, right? The scripture says, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm, the book of Proverbs says. Whether it's graduates or church or choosing godly friends that love Jesus as a lifestyle, our companions in this life help you seize the day. They make all the difference. There's a great YouTube, I didn't want to play it because it's long. That was a great YouTube video of Admiral McRaven, who used to be the head of Special Forces Command, the head of the SEALs. He was over all Special Forces for the United States and SOCOM. And in 2014, at his alma mater, the University of Texas, he gives the graduation speech about 10 things in your life. It is worth watching. Look up Admiral McRaven, commencement speech, University of Texas, 2014. It is worth it. But in that, two of the 10 things that he says... By the way, mother's going to love this. The very first thing he says, if you want to be successful in life, make your bed. I won't give anything else away. It's a great story. But he tells you why that mattered to him as a SEAL. Through 37 years of being a SEAL. Make your bed. But he has two other things he says that are very important. He says, if you want to make it through the life, he learned in bud school, in SEAL training school for six months. They would paddle out the Coronado Island in these tiny little rafts, and they would pick nights when the sea was coming in and the swells were 8 to 10 to 13 feet high and they're in these tiny little blow up rubber boats that they had to carry and they've been up for 4 days straight 96 hours and 6 men get on this boat and they have to paddle out to Corner Island and the only way to get over these huge swells was for all 6 men to dig and to paddle at exactly the same time to lift their oars and to do it again at a cadence and even then it was a God's prayer that you made it over the swells and out there so he says, if you want to make it through this life successfully, much like Jonathan is armor bearer, choose those who will paddle with you. Amen? Choose those that will paddle with you. Later on, he tells a story of at the end of his SEAL training, they took him out to the famous mud pits. And what they do is after you've been up for days and days and days and you're washed out and you're exhausted and you're tapped out and you haven't eaten, they put you in these mud pits that are freezing cold. You're already wet. They strip you down and you're sitting in the mud pits and you're shaking. And he said the people's teeth shattered so hard that that's all you could hear. You could even hear each other's heartbeats as you were linked up in the mud pits. They sink you down to your, your neck and you freeze. And he says, the instructors say, if only five men of you 50, if just five men of you 50 will quit, we'll graduate the other 45 right now. Five guys get up and ring the bell. Just five guys get up and ring the bell. All your buddies don't have to go through anything else. We'll graduate you right now. Right now. He says, as you look across the men, your fellow seals, you could see the men's faces that were going to break. And there was a ton of them. He said, I was ready to break. I was ready to ring the bell right then. Right then. Suddenly, one of his comrades starts to sing the seal song. Through chattering teeth, imperfectly, barely make out the words, but it was enough for the men. And they started singing together through chattering teeth, barely able to make out the words, hardly even, doesn't sound good at all, but it was enough to get them through the next eight hours 
in the mud pits. Not one man quit. And those final group graduated. If you want to be successful in this life, you have to find someone who's going to stick with you, that's a companion, that's going to encourage you. Encouragement is a powerful thing. You find those who are going to stick with you in the mud pits of this life, the hard times, like Jonathan's armor bearer. And you tend to those relationships and you nurture them. And you know what the armor bearer said? I am with you, heart and soul. Hebrews 3.13, let us encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of us may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You want to know why you come on Sunday as a church? It's because God commands us, yes, but it's because we need the encouragement of each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Your pastor needs your encouragement, and you give it. Thank you. And we need to encourage each other. The life that we live is not easy. If you have a super easy life, stand up and we'll applaud you. Because I think most of us, if you've been alive on this earth long, recognize that it's hard. We've got to find those who are going to paddle with us, right? You're going to take a chance? You want to take it with a wingman, right? At the end of the day, they're remaking Top Gun, right? And the character played by Tom Cruise, Maverick, says, at the end of the show, when he finally figures it out, you never, ever, 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 ever leave who? your wingman you want to get higher in this life you want to climb higher choose your companions wisely three if you want to climb higher in this life if you want to get vertical like Jonathan did you want to get over the tough challenges of this life move forward in faith look at verse 8 Jonathan said come on then we will cross over towards them and let them see us now he's exposing them and they're on the low ground they could easily be impaled by arrows and spears and be killed if they say to us, that's the Philistines, wait there until we come to you, we will stay there where we are and not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, he's testing God, right? We will climb up because that will be a sign from the Lord, right? That the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes that they've been hiding in. The outpost shouted down to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. Jonathan stepped out in faith, and God showed up big, right? What does it say? So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Twice in this portion of this passage, Jonathan shows himself to be a man of faith, looking with eyes of faith. He has a deep faith in God. He believes that God wants to conquer the Philistines, and stepping out on faith after seeking God and having a, a wise, godly companion with him, he looks with eyes of faith. Where is God going to show himself big? And he exposes himself. Two men against all these guys that are up there. And they have the high ground. They have superior firepower. If you don't know this, later on it's going to say that Saul and Jonathan had a sword, but everybody else in his army, the Israelite army, was using plows. Not like they got superior weaponry. And yet he exposes himself. And he wants to see what God's going to do, right? And this is what Hebrews 11, 1 and 2 says about faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for. Did Jonathan have confidence that God was going to show up when he exposed himself? Yes, he did. Right? And it says, and it's an assurance, an assurance of what we do not see. Jonathan cannot see how many men are up there or how much firepower they have. He knows he's in a bad position, but he knows his God's bigger. Amen? And they're going to show up big, our God is. And so he exposes himself. He hangs himself out. And he says, let's see what they say. It'll show what God's going to do. Well, it's a sign that God has shown himself big on our behalf. And so they go after it. Why does Jonathan do this? Why is Jonathan a man of faith? He has seen God work big through the life of Samuel. He has seen God work big with his father Saul when Saul was obedient. And he has seen God remove his hand when Saul was disobedient, his father. And he chooses a different life. And we find out the kind of man that he is because later on it says about him and David, the man after his own heart, King David, that they were of one heart and one mind. Jonathan's cut of the same material as David, the man after God's own heart, a man of faith. He knows this truth from Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I sake you, says the Lord, right? So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. What do I have to fear? 
That's easy to say a Bible verse sitting in this church here this Sunday morning, isn't it? It's a lot different when you're on the low ground from something that's going to steamroll you and take your life. But he looked with eyes of faith. If we're going to climb higher, if we're going to climb vertically, if we're going to overcome the challenges of this, we have to seek where God's working. We have to choose our companions wisely. And then we have to look with eyes of faith. Folks, Calvary's grown a lot. We've been averaging in the 190s. You, you can't see that all today, but people are out camping and stuff like that. We've been remodeling. We've been doing different outreaches, doing different things. But I'm telling you, folks, the emphasis that Brother Brad is leading us in as one of your pastor elders on prayer is the next stage. I am convinced that we don't get to the next level of growth. We don't reach people for Christ. People that we've been praying about aren't going to come until we get real serious about prayer. There's a reason there's a prayer box up here and there's prayer teams that are meeting in the chapel praying for your needs right now because we believe that's the game changer. There's a reason we've been putting more emphasis on prayer as elders. There's a reason your pastor's flying to New York City in September to spend time with 40 other Southern Baptist pastors in concerted prayer for three days. Because that's the game changer, folks. People who pray are people of faith. Because it's not what our hands can do, right? Do you remember back in the Old Testament, the book of Zechariah? What God told Zechariah, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The game changer is God's spirit, the Holy Spirit. We have to be obedient and with eyes of faith, pray and then work. Not work and then do prayer on the side. Uh uh. We have to pray. You want to break up the tough ground in Delta, Colorado? You want to penetrate people's lives who are fighting with addictions and broken relationships and all kinds of things? Then we have to bathe them. We have to penetrate them with prayer. And the people who pray are people of faith. We have to look like Jonathan with eyes of faith, trusting that God's going to work on our behalf in the situation. So I'm going to ask you here this morning, what is God calling you to step out on faith on. When I ask people that in private conversations of discipleship, of spiritual formation, usually you get the customary, well, I'm not sure. And then as you spend time with them and love on them and talk to them some more, you try to explore and help them with questions, you get to the fact that, guess what? Most of us know the next thing that God's asking us to do. Most of us, including me, know the next thing that God's asking us to do, but our fears and our anxieties and our lack of faith is what holds us back. Now, that's human. We're all like that. God's grace covers that. So I'm not putting us down. But at some point, we have to pray it up. We have to look with eyes of faith, and then we have to act it out. Amen? We have to step out on faith. Peter stepped out on the waves, and they were pretty tumultuous, right? He could have sunk like a rock, but he didn't because who was there? Jesus Christ. And when he reached and when he believed, he saw Jesus walking on the waves. Peter stepped out of the boat. But guess what? Every single one of us, with what God wants us to do next in whatever relationship and whatever's going on in our lives, and the Spirit tells you that, when you're in the Word of God, when you're in church and the Spirit's talking to you, when you're with another God of believers and the Spirit keeps bringing that up, at some point, friends, you, me, all of us, we have to step out of the boat. There is no substitute for that. And when we do, we can walk on water with Jesus. Amen? We have to step out of the boat. We have to do what is necessary, right? The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Is your heart completely committed to God for His glory, for the building of His kingdom, for His good and not just yours? Are you willing to step out on faith and watch God work? Calvary Church, we have to be those people. We have one church plant, Church Without Walls, and they're doing a good job. But I'm asking the elders to pray about another church plant. And that church plant would be in Uray, Colorado. Okay? In Uray, Colorado. 
It was First Southern Baptist Church of Uray, Colorado that planted Calvary 50 years ago, and now it no longer exists. Wouldn't it be a great feather in God's hat if the church plant of us ended up planting a new Southern Baptist work in Uray, Colorado? Wouldn't that be great? I've already started having some conversations with some men about considering that, asking them to pray. I don't know if the Lord's going to do that. We're just testing the waters. We're just praying. Maybe it's going nowhere. I don't know. But I'm telling you, Western Colorado needs the gospel. And when I'm in your ray and I talk to spiritual Christians there and they talk about this is a very dark place, this is a tough place, this is a very dark, dark place. Your pastor's heart's burdened for that. It's easy for me to sit here in Calvary with a full house on Sunday, but it's hard for me to think about my brothers and sisters in your ray not having the same thing. We need a gospel presence there. And you know what? It's not just me. Steve Huxer's thinking about it and praying through it. Folks, I don't know where that's going to go. I ask you as a church to pray about that. Can the Lord use our church to plant another church? We need to be a reproducing, replanting church that sends out men and women for the gospel of Jesus Christ all over western Colorado. You want to see this area changed? That's what all the churches have to do, whether it's Delta Grace and my buddy Brian Workman, or it's the River and Mr. Neely, or it's us or whoever. We all have to be doing that to make more disciples, to fulfill the Great Commission, which brings us to our next point and the final one. If we're going to climb over life's challenges, we have to trust God for the success. Verse 13 and 14. Jonathan takes action, right? He climbs up, using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And then the Philistines fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. And in that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed 20 men the size of half an acre. Jonathan not only believes that God's at work, but he trusts that God's going to see him through. You don't climb up the cliffs and jump into the pit of the enemy unless you're suicidal, unless you believe God's on your side. And guess what? One man with a sword, remember his, his armor bearer doesn't have one, one man with a sword drops 20 experienced fighters. That's overwhelming forces. But one man with God is greater than a thousand without God. Amen? Amen? Do you remember in 2 Kings, I think it's 6, where Elisha, the Assyrian army, the Syrians are coming, and they're coming against the Israelites, and, and, and Elisha tells his, his minion, go out and do this, and the minion says, but this great army is coming against them, and he prays for him. He says, Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he may see wonderful things that the Lord is doing. And when the servant opened his eyes, the hills were filled with angels and chariots and all these minions of powers of God. And it was greater, that army that was on the hillsides and the mountains, than the Assyrian army, the greatest in the world at that time. There was no way that Israel was going to fall to them. Because God is doing his work. And Jonathan knew that. Two men against 20 is nothing when God's on your side. Trust in God for the success. David's going to do it later on with Goliath. He's going to do it later on with a lot of things, right? David said, look, God, when I'm taking care of the sheep, he allowed me to conquer the bear and the lion. And if he did that, he's going to let me take Goliath. Jonathan had the same said, so I have one heart, right? But listen to this, this little-known passage. Actually, it was members of this church sitting on the front row that shared this passage with me. 2 Samuel 23, 20 and 21. A, a no-name Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant soldier, a fighter from Kazarah, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He went down into a pit on a snowy day, and he killed the lion, and he struck down a huge Egyptian with a mighty spear. Now, I don't know about you, but this guy sounds like he's made of the same thing as David and Jonathan, right? He goes up against the mighty warriors of Moab, and he takes them both down. He destroys the mighty Egyptian. I don't know if he was like Goliath or not, but he was big, and he was powerful, and he takes him down. Okay, all right, MMA match, we'll give it to him. But to go on a snowy, icy, slippery day down into a pit with a ferocious lion? Nah, dude, you got to have your head examined, right? You got to have your head examined. But this is a man of faith. He trusts God. He's just like Jonathan. 
He trusts God and what God's doing. He moves out on faith, right? He seeks where God is moving. And then he trusts God with the success, and he strikes down the lion. Sounds a lot like Daniel in the lion's den. Sounds a lot like many of God's people, right? That faith is the game changer. Faith is what it's all about. And this mighty warrior, Benaiah, the son of this man, little known, obscure passage, he's only in two places in the Holy Scripture. But he has quite a place as this man, this valiant, courageous man of faith that goes down into this pit on a snowy, slippery day with a lion and comes out the other side. Do certain things in your life feel like a pit this morning? Do you feel like that when you approach those things, that it's like you're on slippery ground and you're going to fall in the pit? And sometimes the, the issue, whatever it is, is so big, it's like this overwhelming monster. In fact, I was counseling this couple this week, and they were saying, Greg, this issue's been going on for almost 20 years, and it feels like a monster. That was the word they used. It feels like a monster to our to destroy it. We don't feel like we're going to survive. Guess what? That's the perfect place to be. When we are weak, then God is strong. Amen? When we do not have any resources, that's when God says, finally, you're ready to let me do the work. Finally, you come to the end of your rope, now I can show up big for you. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. If we want to climb to great challenges and overcome huge obstacles in our life, we have to seek God. We have to choose our companions wisely. We have to move out like an arrow on faith, and we have to trust God for the success. That is a bit of a formula that we see with Jonathan. That when we do those things truly from a heart, God shows up big. And you know why we know this is true? It's not from the life of Jonathan. The reason that we know this is true is from the life of a descendant later on whose name starts with J2. And he was up against all odds. And he was actually abandoned by all his closest companions. All 12 of them scattered when the shepherd was struck. He walked the path of the Villa de la Rosa alone. He left his throne in heaven, came to earth, dwelt among us, was one of us, lived perfect, sinlessly, did everything right, so that when we all abandoned Jesus, he could go all in for the Father's will. The way that he said in John chapter 4 and chapter 6, my food is to do the will of the Father. And that when many of his disciples and his close friends, and everybody tried to get a path to the cross, to step in in our place, he would not be denied. That when even in his own humanity, his own flesh, in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, I wish that you would take this away from me, but not what? Not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is the ultimate person that sought the Lord, that chose wisely, that moved out on faith, and trusted the Father with the rest of it, right? It was Jesus that was on the cross, in your place, and burying our sins and the sins of the whole world as the atoning sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice in our place, that says in a prayer to the Father, Father, forgive them. By the way, them is us, is me. Father, forgive them for not what they do. Jesus proves that what we see in the life of Jonathan, a man of faith, is exactly how we should live because that's how he lived. This morning, if you're a believer here this morning and you're stuck a little bit, sometimes we're stuck in the cold mud pit, amen? And it's tough. And we've all been there. Reach out for God to pull you along the way, right? Maybe you're there. Maybe you need to come during the invitation time. Maybe you need to just pray about that situation for God to break the hold that it has on your life and to move you forward by faith. Guess what? The disciples prayed for faith. They didn't have faith at times, and they said, Lord, give us faith, and Jesus answered that prayer. All you have to have is the faith of a tiny little smidgen, 
and God can multiply that and move mountains, he says, right? Maybe you're here this morning and something in your life and you need to move out on faith and just come and pray to God and pour out your heart before Jesus and see what he does. Test the Lord and see what he does. See what he does. Maybe you're here this morning on this Memorial Weekend. You don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You can't identify with Jonathan because you can't ever imagine living that way. And that's okay. Because God takes you from any core of the world that you come from. No matter what you're coming from, no matter what you've done, no matter what your sin, no matter what your bad story is, guess what? He makes it all, right? If you don't believe so, the thief on the cross, right next to him is the perfect example. That horrible criminal, he forgave and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But the man had to come to Jesus on Jesus' term, give his life to Christ. And he calls out to me, he says, Lord, instead of hurling insults, when you die, remember me today. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today can be the day that you are made right with God. Today could be the game changer, the day that you need to seize the day, carpe diem, and make a decision for Christ, and your life will never be the same. When I made a decision for Christ, even as a young boy at eight, only part of the knowledge, just as I am, knowing way ahead of time where I was going when I had no clue, when I was a squirrely little quiet little guy that was scared of the world. You'd never know that now, right? But Jesus, Jesus takes you just the way you are, but he won't leave you there. He'll take you to great heights where you can vertically climb and overcome anything with him. My invitation to you this morning is if you're here today, you don't, you've never said to God, Lord, I recognize that I personally have a problem with you, that I have offended you, that I've sinned against you, that I've gone against you and done my own thing. And I ask you to forgive me of that, and I want you to take control of my life and give me eternal life. And I trust you completely to do that. It's just that simple. If you've never done that today, when the band comes and we, we get started and they're playing, the invitation's going, please come. We would love, Steve and I would love to talk.